All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live. It's Thursday, which means that I'm joined today by Catherine McPhail. Hi, Catherine. Hello, Jeff. And we have hidden right now in our green room a special guest that will be joining us here in just a minute. Uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation today. If you're watching this live, you probably already know this. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, you need to know that we've spent the week this week talking about topics that revolve all around the uh, idea of courage. We've talked a lot this week about courage maybe courage leading to confidence, what's required to be confident. And so Monday, we started out talking about fear. Tuesday, we talked about the imposter syndrome. Yesterday, Wednesday, we talked about perfectionism. And we'll dig deeper into the courage it takes to do the work that we do today with our special guest here. Um, as you come in, first of all, say hi. Let us know that you're here as you're logging in here from wherever you are. We're streaming live right now to the Entree Architect Community Facebook group, to LinkedIn, to YouTube, and to Twitch for all of our fans out there on Twitch, which first in today, Kurt from Flint, Michigan, I see you over there on Twitch. Um, anybody else that's out there, go ahead and uh, let us know that you're here. And let us know where you're joining the conversation from. Catherine, there is a link that I just lost. I apologize. The link that they can connect their uh, Facebook to. I'll find <laughs> it. Um, we, we, hopefully, we will be able to find that link that uh, allows you to uh, show us your name from Facebook. That's a permissions thing from Facebook. So take a look for that here in just a minute. But in the meantime... We're going to get started here. We've got a special guest. They're in our green room right now, getting ready for us to quit talking and bring them on here live. So with that, let me tell you that our guest today is a writer, an educator, a commenter, a commentator, uh, and a podcaster. Her works range from an opinion column in the New York Times to memoirs like the best-selling Hunger to short story collections like the best-selling Difficult Women, to comic book series like Black Panther, World of Wakanda, to her best-selling essay collection, which you probably have heard of, Bad Feminist. Soon, I think you'll see her work appearing on screens big and small. Roxanne Gay, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Thank you for joining us today, Roxanne. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here this afternoon. All right. Thank you. Uh, many of you know, uh, as we do our social media, as we do our announcements, um, that our guest, our planned guest today was Debbie Millman, who's the host of the uh, Design Matters podcast. But Debbie's not feeling well today. So shout out to Debbie. Hope she is feeling better soon. And Roxanne was kind enough to uh, take Debbie's place. And so we're, we're equally as excited to talk to Roxanne today. And um, I see you coming in now, everyone, and, and uh, Catherine has posted the link that you can connect your Facebook to uh, Restream if you'd like so that we can see your uh, see what your name is when you're commenting. So make sure you look out for that. Um, Roxanne, like I said, and as you know, we've been talking about courage, different mm -hmm. things that, that require courage. Um, and so... You know, I, I think about it again, our audience is probably today going to be mostly architects. You're not an architect, you're a writer, prolific writer at that. Um, a lot of what we've talked about fear, holding us back, imposter syndrome, perfectionism. I just rattled off a whole list of bestsellers mm -hmm. that, uh, that you have written, that you have produced, uh, in, in lots of different genres, by the way. And, that's just the tip of the iceberg of your work. And so it's, it strikes me that when we're talking about all of these things that we've been talking about all week, it's got to take a lot of courage. And maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's got to take a lot of courage for you to put pen to paper or uh, maybe look at the blank screen with a blinking cursor or what, whatever, whatever tools you use to do your work. But how much courage does it take 
to put yourself out there like you do every time that you write something? Well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, it depends, honestly. A lot of times people think I have far more courage than I actually do. Okay. Uh, but it does take some courage to write. Not to write. I think, you know, if you're just keeping your writing to yourself, it takes some courage, but not the most courage. But to put your work in front of an audience and subject yourself to their opinions uh, takes a lot of courage. And I tend to be terrified about almost everything I write and how it's going to be received. And I just submit, I put my work out anyway, despite the terror. And if you want to call that courage, sure. <laughs> but um, the fear is um, overwhelming. And, you know, I think it's because I know that there's something at stake. And I think whenever we care, we tend to be afraid. Uh, because we, you know, there's so much that can be on the line, especially as a writer. Um, the writing life for most writers is pretty precarious. And I, I, that's why I always tell young writers, keep your day job. Your day job is your best friend. It's a lot easier to create when you're not worried about paying the rent, buying groceries, putting gas in your car. Um, so, you know, I just try to balance fear and, uh, and the ability to like work through the fear. And, you know, this is what I've done with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, th there's a lot of great points wrapped up into that. And, and I think, um, you know, one, one of the things that I wonder, as you were, as you were explaining that, I started to think, you know, that you're talking a lot about the creative process and the risk in the creative process and putting yourself out there. Um, how do you, how you said you push through it. So how do you push through it? Is, is do you have tools? Do you have techniques that you used, or is it just? Do you just count down and then push the button? Because that's what I do sometimes. <laughs> what I do is I tell myself that no one's going to read my work, and so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what I've said and how it's received because there's there is going to be no reception, and that is incredibly useful. And of course the deeper I get into my career, the more challenging it is to nurture that disbelief. Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, I sure do. And um, yeah, I just tell myself it doesn't matter. Like, girl, say what you want. It's going to be fine. Are, are you ever surprised? At the well, I, I'm sure you can be surprised at some of the, you know, some of the stuff that comes in. But are are you ever surprised because you're setting up that disbelief in your mind? Are you ever surprised at the number of people that that have read or have engaged? Yes, I am. You know, when you're a writer, you don't expect to find an audience. something is going to happen with your career that you're going to find an audience and that maybe once in a while you'll make a little more and that audience appreciates what I have to say uh, it's a small miracle and it's something that I never take for granted uh, that's I think that's an incredible outlook it um, you know for I think for a lot of us, you know, whether it is a podcast or you are writing, I, I, uh, there, there's a part of me that thinks that we ought to go into it, not worrying whether or not there's, there's an audience, but the reality is, and like you said, don't, don't quit your day job. The reality is, especially if, if we're maybe for this audience who are professionals, right? Professional services. So if they're an architect or they're you know, they're, they're a doctor or they're an attorney, whatever they are. Um, there's different versions of course, of putting yourself out there, no matter what you do, but the, um, they're, they're required, I suppose, to at least put on an air of confidence. You know, they, no patient wants their doctor to walk into the exam room and go, yeah, I really don't know what I'm doing. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we've got to project at least an air of confidence, but I was thinking earlier today that I, I can't, I don't think I can imagine a state where doctor, attorney, architect, whatever, 
where in the first meeting with their client or their patient, whatever they call them, the person they serve, where they have all the answers right then. So it's just, it's got to be this process of figuring out as you go. So that's got to require courage as well. Like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm dealing with whatever this is. Um, and any yeah. advice for somebody that that's in a figure it out as you go, but you've got to project confidence um, from the, from the get go. Well, I don't know that you need to project confidence. I think you need to project competence and mm, those interesting. Are, yeah, and, yeah. you know, I, I think confidence is attractive uh, in a professional context, in a personal context, but not everyone has all the answers all of the time, but I want to be able to trust any professional that I'm working with, whether it's in the creative field or in the professional field. In fact, now we're about to hire an architect to build a house. Um, I want to know that that person can do and execute my vision and can do what I need them to do and can admit when they don't know something, but can find answers to those questions. And competence is something that does that. There are all kinds of confident people that are utterly incompetent and who do sloppy work. And right. the confidence is in fact uh, a disguise, it's a shield. And, um, you know, I think we put way too much stock in the importance of confidence um, without substance. Yeah, I, I co completely agree with you there. So you, you've opened up a, you know, a wormhole now, right? I think she's <laughs> already got her, he's, she's already got a short list, everybody. Don't get excited. No, I don't yeah. actually. Oh, no, you don't. From scratch, um, but wow. we're building in Los Angeles. In Los um, Angeles. Oh, we are building I, in Los Angeles. Okay. Wow. Well, let, be let me ask you this then, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of, a lot of architects listening right now. When someone is there you go when someone is looking to hire an architect to design a home mm -hmm. this is this is great because this is the other side of the table right what do you think you want in an architect and how will you make that selection i think that's she wants someone question. super arrogant and confident i think <laughs> right yeah that's exactly what i want right um, that's a really good question and i think one of the things we need to figure out is what we want in an architect you know, people have given us some names and these are incredibly impressive architects who have beautiful mm -hmm. portfolios. And it, it seems like, yes, they would be wonderful to work with, but, you know, we want someone who's going to actually listen to us mm -hmm. about what we want. One of us is a designer. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. One of us has all kinds of really, really intense opinions about how things should look. And so we also need someone who's kind of flexible and who will be patient with working with the designer. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we also want someone who has creative ideas and who can stand up to us. And, you know, sometimes like, you'll be like, I want a swing set in the living room. And I'm sure there's an architect who will be like, I hear you, but. <laughs> and I can see so, why that would be fun. That's yeah. I, you know, I also want someone who will push back when our ideas are just unrealistic or they're in the long term won't look good um, or won't be useful for us. So, um, you know, it starts with, do you share our aesthetic and do mm -hmm. you like beautiful things and can you create beautiful spaces? And then, you know, what are you like to work with? Um, how busy are you? How responsive are you on email? Like those kinds of things matter. And, um, how do you create boundaries and say, that's enough. Don't email me anymore <laughs> for the day. <laughs> I, you know, frankly, that's not going to happen because we're actually too busy. But um, we just want to know that we're, you know, that th this is a dream home that we'll be building if we can't find the right house. And so far we haven't found the right house. And so and we're going to be spending a lot of money. And so we would like to know that that money is going to be well spent. Yeah. Yep. yeah. That I all. mean, I'm not even in California, and I just love hearing that. You're going to spend a lot of money. <laughs> you want a swing set? I mean, that's... Yeah, so cool. I mean, we just want to go all out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, have a diff we have a couple different, like, sort of constraints. You know, we both, we need two home offices. We need we need a, an in-law suite or a second home on the property for my parents. We need, I mean, it's just a lot. And so we need someone who can accommodate all of that. And it's, in LA, this is like... 
I don't want to say standard, like everyone has it, but there are a lot of houses that have in-law suites in Los Angeles mm -hmm. because, sure. there's a, because there's a housing crisis and the city has decided one of the ways to solve that high, high crisis is to allow people to build these things they call ADUs. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's like all of that. And so it's a kind of exciting, but it's also overwhelming. Yep. So if you, if you're talking to an architect, right. And they've, you've seen their portfolio, like you said, and, and I'm, I'm guessing you're going to go through some, a set of interviews basically yeah. to talk to these people. Um, do you have any feel, and I know some of it is just going to be, you'll get a, you'll get a feeling about mm -hmm. someone, you know, just the same way we, we get feelings, no matter what we're searching for. Um, do you have any idea how, let's see, how, how do I want to ask this? How you might uh, balance all of those things that, that you're talking about and how you might quote unquote score it? Or is it just going to be a, you know, I'll, I'll know it when I see, or we'll know it when we see it kind of thing. I think it's one of those, we'll know it when we see it kinds of things, but artists are temperamental. So beautiful design is going to be a priority. Like, mm -hmm. I don't need you to hold my hand. I don't need you to be my friend. I, I mm -hmm. have friends, you know, I, I do need you to respect me, but I don't need you to be warm and fuzzy. And so really for me, open communication, a willingness to hear our ideas, but just a beautiful aesthetic is going to be the priority because uh, when the job is done, we're going to actually need to live in the house, not live with the person who designed it. <laughs> and so uh, for me, the, the artistic skill, the architectural skill is, is most important. And so I would say like, that would be 60% of it, if not more. That's kind of interesting because we were talking about, um, that is actually interesting because we have been talking about emotional intelligence with, you know, how important is that as architects, people have varying degrees of it and everything. And so, so the idea of relating to clients and being able to be um, emotionally in tune with them and that sort of thing is um, something that we think about. But so it's kind of interesting to think that you um, aren't, it's kind of crushing, actually, to think that you're not interested in being friends with your architect after. Because I guess well, we all I mean, do that. Happens, that's wonderful. Like, I, I I, would enjoy that very much. Like, the woman, who, the realtor who sold me my first house is our realtor now. And we, we became friends through the process. And I think we'll always be friends. And so um, it's, yeah, it's just, if it doesn't happen, it's okay. If you're, like, not a you're perfect sort of friendly person, if we don't jive on a personal level, but right. we jive on a professional level, it's yeah. totally, totally fine. That makes sense. Yeah, that's great. I guess we like to think we need to be more charming, you know, and that's going to get us the job, but I guess. Yeah, and oh, you know, yeah. The, I, I teach, or, I, or sometimes, I used to be a professor, um, I'm taking a couple years off. You know, people tend to expect you to be sort of like, they think of it as client services, and it's not, it's mm -hmm. education. Um, and so it's frustrating sometimes to have to be expected to be an entertainer and a charmer, but also to be an expert in my field. <laughs> it's like, wait, you, you can have two of those three. You can't have all three. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a lot of balls to have in the year. It is. Um, I know Catherine is uh, working on a, I, a it's too long to fit in there. Can I just, re can I read it? And then I'll yeah, summarize yeah, it later. It. Okay, so we had a question from Rod who said, I would like her to talk about the two creator households and the challenges associated with having the space, privacy, energy, support needed and given, required to do good work and give good partner. I want that last That's part. A great question, Rod. You know, we're figuring that out. Right now, what we're doing is um, she's based in uh, New York and I'm based in Los Angeles, and we go back and forth every few months. And it's interesting because we each have very specific spaces and we also have home office. We both have home offices in both spaces. Um, but in one city, you know, it's her aesthetic that dominates and in the other it's mine. And so what we're looking for is a space where both of us can feel like we are, it doesn't have to necessarily be equal because as my mom says, there's no such thing as 50, 50 in a marriage, but, um, where we both feel well represented and where there are creative spaces and especially for Debbie, a space where she can do the business side of her work, but also 
a studio space where she can do the more creative hands-on side of her work, a place where we can have some of our staff show up once in a while and not feel like they're in our private home space. Mm -hmm. um, a space where you look around and you know that creative people live in this space. And so I'm a writer, uh, yes, I'm a writer. And <laughs> so, you know, I have a ton of books. I have a home library. And so, you know, we want to be able to display books. We want to be able to display, we both have significant art collections. And so we want to be able to display the collections. You know, we just looked at a house in Silver Lake and it was a beautiful, beautiful home. And it was uh, Barbara Bester, which mm. is great. And um, there was not really much wall space. And so mm. as we were walking through it, we were like, yeah, it was the right size. It actually had an office section. It had like, lit it had an in-law suite. It had literally everything we were looking for, but there was nowhere to put the art. And so things like that matter to us. And, and the, it, the, this kind of stuff fuels our creativity, um, both personally and professionally. So that's kind of what we're looking for. And also really lovely common spaces because we do spend a lot of social time together now, especially with COVID. Um, things changed. And I saw one, someone asked, you know. Yeah, I was gonna put that up there. Needs for space changed. Well, one, ample space to work. We actually converted a bedroom, a master bedroom. We have, I have two master bedrooms in, in LA and um, don't, it's not as fancy as it sounds. <laughs> and so we turned one of them into Debbie's home office because it has big windows, it has high ceilings. And so she can really create in there and also teach and do her other things. And so we're thinking more now about like, how can we genuinely be comfortable at home and both in terms of our work, but in terms of having friends over and uh, cooking for dinner and knowing like we may not be able to leave the house for three months. So like what kind of space do you want to be in when you cannot go outside? Uh, that's helping um, shape what we want. Speaking of cooking, which I know is, is that, do you call it cooking or baking? What, what is, what is your passion? Don't you? I do both. Okay. So I, I, saw, I saw a tweet of yours. This, this is way off on a tangent. I'm just apologizing ahead of time. So <laughs> we, we, we were got off on a tangent yesterday of cookies and yeah, yeah. you had a, you Easy had a do. tweet in the last day or so. I forget when it was about French toast cookies. I did. Oh, what's and that? I, Does it involve raisins? Cause we hope not. That was a big controversy no at all. No. Um, so Christina Tosi is, uh, the owner of Milk Bar. She's an incredible baker based here in New York. And, um, Debbie had done some consulting for her from Milk Bar at one point and she had appeared on Debbie's podcast. And I started following her because I was really interested in, cause I love baking. And at the time I didn't have any time because I tour constantly pre COVID and so I was on the road almost every week. So I would read about bakers and just enjoy like their recipes. And so she has this thing she started during the pandemic called Bake Club, where once a week or so, it used to be every day, but now it's about once a week. She does a video and she bakes something lovely. And most of the stuff is like stuff I'm never gonna eat. But a couple of days ago, she did a video about French toast cookies. And I was like, well, that, <laughs> that is something I would enjoy. And so I um, went online and found the recipe and cause I was writing it down from her video and I was like, I don't have all day for this. And so I used Google, I found the recipe and I made the cookies last night and it was a lot of fun. It was a really great recipe. She writes really good recipes and French toast cookies. It's got bits of French toast inside what is essentially a sugar cookie base. I, I saw it. I saw, I saw your tweet. I saw the picture and I about fell out. So <laughs> it's <was laughs> like, I highly <laughs> recommend if you enjoy baking, it, it's. Which one there, is it? And there are lots of them here. Um, Actually, I'm going to post it for everybody to make, we can make them and yes, yeah, so later. You know, if you Google Christina Tosi French uh, Bake Club, it's on mm -hmm. the Bake Club website. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Well, before I, uh, before I have to run off and grab a cookie or something, uh, we better pull it, <laughs> pull it back. Um, with, with the new home in LA is, is the podcast studio going to be built yep. in it? 
Yeah. Absolutely. We have a podcast studio in each house because we both have podcasts. Yeah. And we will be making a special, if not in one, if not two. And I know that sounds weird, but we both, we, we have recording conflicts more than you would think. And so um, we want a room that's dedicated because right now um, it's my office that doubles as a podcast studio. And we've sort of put up um, soundproofing and things like that, but it's not ideal. And we know we could get better sound quality from just a dedicated home studio. And it doesn't have to be big, quite honestly. It's, oh, yeah. you know, if we find like a walk-in closet that we don't need, it could be that. But yes, there will absolutely be a dedicated podcast studio wherever yeah. we end up. Wow. It, it is interesting that your, your creatives in, in your work, mm -hmm. uh, not, not to discount the podcasting in any way, because that's huge for both of you, but, but, uh, you've got so many different facets of the, uh, uh, of the creative and, and, um, each one having their own. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's going to have to be uh, almost a no arc of, uh, of things. Yeah. If we can find a way to do it so that it's one room, but divided in half, I mean, we're not going to dedicate two entire rooms in a house to this, I assure you, but we are, I'm, I am, my goal is to find a way for us to be able to record at the same time without letting the podcast dominate the house because studios are not really attractive places. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. So we have a question here from Chris <clears throat> Novelli. I don't know. It's all going to fit as uh -huh. a creative person during these unique times. What are some ways to put yourself out there in different ways? I think he's, well, I don't know what he's thinking, but I'm, you know, just that we have to change what we would normally be doing. Cause we have the travel and all that. Yeah. You know, um, I'm really lucky. I have speaking agents. And so they put me out there for me. <laughs> um, the first, I panicked when we I realized that the world was going to shut down. And I also told myself, oh, it's going to be three months. I can live for three months without income. Um, because like many writers, I make more income from touring and public speaking than I do from writing. So, you know, I just thought, okay, I can get through three months. And then I thought I can get through a year, which I could. And fortunately around three or four months in people started to figure out ways of doing virtual events. Mm -hmm. And so that actually, that work has returned. And in some ways I am able to go to places that I would not ordinarily want to travel to <laughs> because I am doing these virtual spaces. But I think that if you are looking for ways to put yourself out there right now as a creative person, you should be willing to propose an idea to whoever would be hosting some sort of event or creative opportunity. I think right now people are looking for innovation. And I think that there is a really rich opportunity here for people to do something more than just like a Zoom reading or conversation or panel. I mean, those are well and good, but I have seen enough at this point. And I would love to see someone really innovate in this space and, and do something fresh. I watched this uh, play um, several months ago that was produced in part by Jeremy O'Harris who did Slave Play. And I'm forgetting the name, but it was unlike anything I had ever seen. And it really worked as a play designed to be executed in a virtual space. And I would love to see more creative people doing that sort of thing, thinking outside of the computer screen and the proverbial box. Uh, and I think artists can put themselves out in that way by using their imaginations to come up with these interesting ideas and then pitching them to whomever. Sometimes, I think especially over the past year, I think a lot of creative people have realized that we can't sit and wait for the work to come to us because a lot of people don't ever prioritize creativity and they're certainly not going to prioritize it during a pandemic. And so we have to show them why they need to make it a priority. And I, that's the challenge in front of us. And I think most of us are capable of rising to that occasion. That's really, that's a really great comment. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, selfishly get this in before the next question, but you just said something about, um, most people not prioritizing creativity, which I think mm -hmm. is completely true. And 
I know that many of the architects who are watching this, especially when it comes to designing homes, right? You, you, there are a lot of options depending on where you are in the country. You can go to a builder, you can uh, buy one that's already existing, you can renovate it or not. Uh, there's mm-hmm. lots, lots and lots of options out there. So, and, and you said that you had looked at some and hadn't found mm-hmm. a home. And we're that, looking, but we just, the more we look, the more we realize, ugh. At what the price point is reaching, we might as well just either renovate a sort of tear down or start from scratch on a piece of empty land. Um, so yeah, it, 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 there's so many options. It's overwhelming. Well, mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. Since there are so many options, why are you going to an architect? Why are you going to use an architect rather than say a builder or somebody like that? It's a trick question. <laughs> it's not a trick question. <laughs> I think we're going to yeah. use both, honestly. Well, sure. Um, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You know, no, the architect, I think, is because we're both creative people and we have such specific needs. And we have seen a lot of houses from builders, like these brand new renos and gut jobs. LA is good for them. Like they're a dime a dozen. And they're extraordinarily expensive, but they're all so bland. They're like, let's just, you know, take this 8,000 square foot lot and put a 7,800 square foot house on it. True story. And, you know, it looks, it's all white walls and weird, ugly marble. And, you know, it's like a very masculine aesthetic, but not even interesting masculine. It's no, I know, I know. It's a weird, we got to name it. Like, because that's all over the country. It's the same. Yeah, it's so, sh- I it's like, I get it. And like, on the one hand, it's appealing and that you move in and it's a tabula rasa. You can do whatever. Right. But on the other hand, it's like at this price point, uh, like I want it to be like one of the things Debbie has said at most of the houses we looked at, she's like, this isn't special. It doesn't right. feel there's no grand entrance. There's nothing memorable. There's no quirkiness. And it's all very, it's supposed they call it like luxury, but it's all just cookie cutter. Yeah. And so I don't know that there's the same level of creativity or refinement with a builder with all due respect to builders. My right. dad's an engineer, so I'm all down with builders, but um, yeah. I think they try to do what people like, like this is what people like is what they tell me all the time. Like who are the people? What people? So yes. I don't know. Exactly. Like who, you know, especially in Los Angeles, I tend to wonder like, who are you designing this house for? I, and I know that the answer is like some rich guy who, doesn't have any kids who yeah. want to have a bachelor pad, but exactly. it's like a bachelor pad is this size. Like what is <laughs> really, that's a big yeah. bachelor. So um, yeah, someone said it's the restoration hardware aesthetic. And that's actually very true. I've seen a lot of staged houses with the restoration hardware furniture and I have a restoration hardware couch. And so I'm not judging restoration hardware, but right. for an entire house, that's a lot of, a lot, yeah. that's a lot of uh, dark, heavy furniture. <laughs> Rod says not interesting masculine is his life story so a sad <laughs> a sad tale that is all right you you had a a uh, question up there that I stepped yeah. all over Catherine I apologize well that's okay I didn't I just I just was getting excited about doing my job but, <laughs> I mean I'm glad we continued on to have that part of the um so where am I here? So Jay actually says you taught a master class on writing for social change. And what can you tell us in two minutes that we can take to our work? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, I think the most important thing that I try to impart um, when it comes to writing at all is that you have to be consistent in your practice. And that's not the sexy part that people, you know, people want to hear about the like, soaring creativity and that that magic of creation, which is absolutely important, but you have to give yourself as many opportunities as possible to get to that magical moment, to say the amazing thing that's gonna create social change. And for me, um, consistency and practice has been the thing. You know, I am incredibly prolific, not by choice, but um, I think that's what the market has demanded. I think writers of color have a different level of expectation for what they need to produce to get to the same place that some of our white peers achieve with far less. Mm -hmm. And so consistent practice has made it possible, like write every day. And you don't have to do it every day. Consistent just means regular. 
Um, but for me, that has meant writing every day, reading every day, and spending time thinking about what I care about, doing research every day. And I think consistency tends to start to show up in your work and it gives you an authority that you can then use to bring your readers to whatever place you want them to be at by the time they finish an essay or a story or a book. Uh, and so I think a lot of it starts with consistency, no matter what you're doing creatively. For those of you that are out there in the audience that joined us several weeks ago when we had Seth Godin on as a guest, did any of that sound familiar to you? I mean, to me, that's one of those, when we start hearing multiple people saying very similar things, it becomes, that's got to be truth, right? Because Seth Godin talked about, you know, something very similar. You put in the work. Um, and of course, he he says, um, you know, a lot of the work that he's he's put out is not great work, and but eventually you might hit on something that's good. So I, I love that idea of of um, some, sometimes we got to grind, right? Yeah, and you know, it's not really glamorized, and it, it shouldn't be. And I want and also I, I do think it's important to make a distinction between grind and overwork, because. Yeah. So many industries, especially I'm thinking of video games in particular, but I think it can apply to almost, I was an ar architecture major back in the day. Um, yeah, grind you were, is- You were um, an architecture major? I was, when I was at Yale, I majored in architecture. What, how um, did we even miss that? That is huge. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but the, you know, the problem with my architecture was I had really great ideas um, in terms of like interesting things for buildings, but A, I'm not great at drawing. But more importantly, I had no sense of structure. And so none of my shit was going to stand up ever. Well, that's why you have an engineer. You should don't, don't give up on your dreams. You don't have to draw or have, have any structural. <laughs> no, I found something else to do with my creativity. But yeah, wow. you know, well, grinding shouldn't be like grinding yourself into the ground. Yeah. Right. But you should probably also tell your future architect that you were an architecture major. No, I, will never, I will never oh, ever admit that ever well, because I don't want them to think I'm trying to be like I took a few biology classes <laughs> and then when I'm talking like you know when people some people yeah. talk to a doctor and they're like I can do that I'm like no I can't do that no yeah <laughs> yeah well um so it just reminded me of the done and shipped um someone had previously asked Mark had previously asked a question about do you have support and do you have tools or tips for getting the work out every day I guess done and shipped yeah um, well, I have a full-time assistant and that goes a really long way because she does all of the stuff I don't want to do and also manages my calendar. She manages a lot of emails and scheduling, travel arrangements, uh, coordinating meetings, coming to meetings to take notes. And when you have someone to handle all of those, in fact, I'm about to hire her an assistant. When you have someone to manage all of that, it makes it so much easier to be creative. So many people struggle with creativity because there's, and myself included, like when you don't have any help, you have to do it all yourself. You're not only the creative engine, but you're also the mechanic that keeps the engine functioning. And so having support staff has been incredibly useful to getting the work done. Uh, deadlines are somewhat useful, but I tend to not make them. <laughs> so. <laughs> don't know how good of a tool they are <laughs> and um just ambition i mean ambition mm -hmm. work goes, does a lot of the work to keep moving forward to keep creating not only good not only work but good work and so yes i love that because a, a lot of the topics that we cover are you know, I, I often open up and say they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture and I think that's a great point. And if you're a small firm, if you're a solopreneur, if you're one person, you know, you're wearing a lot of hats mm -hmm. and, and and you have to. But I, I think that that idea of creating space by hiring an assistant or an assistant to your assistant or whatever that looks like, for, you know, for someone's context, I think creating that space for creativity is a really important idea that I hope everybody takes away from from that comment. Uh, I think it's really important. I'm I'm 
hundred percent guilty of as charged, but, um, that's, that's a, that's a great, great idea. Great concept there. And it took a long time for me to get to a place like, like one, I wanted to make sure I could only do it when I could pay the person a, a fair wage and mm-hmm. provide health insurance, which I do and provide retirement, which I do mm-hmm. and until I could do that. I was not going to do it because I just, it was not something that my principles would allow, but I also had to teach myself to delegate because I'm a control freak and I'm just like, I could just do it myself. <laughs> like that's not helping. <laughs> and so right. it, it's actually really hard to relinquish some of that control. Um, but I am still an ongoing project, but teaching myself to relinquish control and to trust Caitlin uh, is my assistant and Assistant isn't even, it doesn't feel like an adequate word for what she is in my practice, but um, it's just uh, challenging, but I'm so grateful that I have it now because I was really drowning and now I'm drowning, but I can sort of, I'm holding onto a life raft. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That I, I think a lot of people can, uh, can identify with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was just saying that to my assistant this morning. I, I said, I could get somebody to do this and that, but I could also do it. She's like, you could do it. Like, yeah, I could. And I can't, I don't know. I can't let you do it. So we're having this little thing. So maybe you're going to inspire me to let it just trust her. Yeah. Just trust her, you know, and it's hard. There are sometimes like, when, and when she doesn't do it exactly the way I want her to do it, there, yeah. there are times when I get like, ah, and then I think, wait, no, if, I want it done my way, then I need to do it. If she does it her way and gets to whatever result I need, it doesn't matter how she got from point A to point Z. Mm-hmm. You know, what matters is that she got there and she did it well. And right. so, yeah, it's challenging though. I'm, I'm glad to hear I'm not the only one who sort of struggles. Well, you're not the only one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I, so, I think you're surrounded by a community that struggles. <laughs> we were just talking about perfectionism the other day and it kind of ties into that in a way, right? Yeah. It's, it's like, I want it done. Like, I think I'm not a perfectionist, but then it turns out like, Oh, no, no. You're supposed to put the carrots against the bread with the mayonnaise. It's not supposed to be between the cheese and the cucumber because that's not going to work, you know? So it turns out I'm really, really particular about certain things. And, um, you know, I might be hard to work with. And it's okay. Not enough women allow themselves to be difficult. Meanwhile, <laughs> our, our friends, our male friends, they like revel in being difficult and they're celebrated for it. Like, look at this amazing artist. He's so difficult, but he's brilliant. And a woman is just like, difficult and therefore incompetent. Well, yeah. Hmm. I don't, I don't that's think a whole nother care. podcast. Maybe that's your podcast. I think, right. So. <laughs> um, so should I ask this question, Jeff? Yeah, Go ahead. And yeah, go ahead and do that. And I've got one I want to so find. Just to well. follow up a little bit on your consistency thing. Do you have like, do you have a, specific routine that you follow in order to stay consistent every day? I do not simply because just the nature of my life does not allow it from one day to the next. Everything is going to be different. My career is weird. And you know, like normally as a writer, you write a book, you put it into the world. You're, if you're lucky, people review it, respond to it. You write another book, but I've had opportunities to move into film and television um, the public speaking I've been on it. I've done a little acting, even though I have no interest in it. Um, what were you on? I was were on the L word. Show? I was on the L word. It was a lot of fun. Oh, it was fun. a lot of fun. And also like weird, but you know, <laughs> because of these opportunities, um, every day is different. Every day is kind of an adventure. And so I just make the time. And sometimes I have, Caitlin, build it into my calendar, um, unstructured time so that I can either read and or write or think or or outline or whatever I need to do. Um, And so that's the consistent thing that I just try to find the time. And not every day is going to be three or four or eight or 10 hours of writing. Some days I I do 30 minutes, Um, but at least it keeps that muscle limber and it allows me to sort of the next day and the day after still be able to do what I need to do because I haven't like the muscle memory isn't gone. That's awesome. The muscle memory. We, we've got to develop that. 
hours? That's a long time to be writing. I was thinking it half is. an hour. It is. When I'm Every in the day. throes of like really, like I wrote my first novel in about four months, two, three or four months. And I did it by writing about 10 to 12 hours a day. I wow. summer, it was a summer between my first and second years as a faculty member. And so I did have the summer off ish. And so I used that time because I knew I would not have this opportunity again until the next summer. And uh, I found that that intense period of writing, I was also single at the time and I don't have children. Uh, so I had a life that made this possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it is intense. And I, I enjoy it because I love writing, but it's, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea. It just seems kind of like a great, I just like a big, huge chunk of time to be doing, like concentrating on something. That just sounds great to me. So it's so great. It's so great. Everyone should, if you want, if you want it, everyone should be able to do it. Yeah. It's just, we should just do it. Um, Jeff, I, I've been reminded that it's coming up on 45 minutes. Yes, I know we are, Roxanne, I know we're up against your time limit. Um, and we really appreciate you being here today. It's, we didn't know necessarily where the conversation was was going to go, and we appreciate all the rabbit trails that uh, we were able to go down with you. We th thank you very much for joining us. Uh, for all the architects that are out there that heard uh, Roxanne or will hear either in the podcast version or you watch the recording of this later, you heard Roxanne talking about architecture from the client's point of view. So, uh, that, that's yeah. something that we don't get a whole lot in these conversations. So I hope you all pay attention to what Roxanne was saying, um, you know, about their process and, and everything. So, um, Thank you very much, Roxanne. We really appreciate you. And uh, again, we hope Debbie gets to feeling better soon. And um, before, right before you go, yeah. uh, tell me this. What's, what's the next thing that's coming out for you? Yeah, I have a book coming out on November 16th called How to Be Heard. And it's a book of writing advice. And some of it's incredibly practical because not a lot of writing advice is practical. It's more sort of... Um, like Annie Lamott, Bird by Bird, which is a stunning book. I love it. I return to it, but it's spiritual. And this is more like, here's how you actually get it done. And then it's partly about how to use your voice to make the kind of statements you want and to put the kind of work into the world that you want and ideally to create social change. So um, I'm looking forward to that book. Excellent. Thank yeah, you thank for you. that. And for those of you who are watching this, of course, um, you can find Roxanne's work, uh, her her books, uh, I, wherever books are sold, of course. Um, lots of bestsellers on the list. that will be very easy to find. Um, you can also check out her column in the New York Times, as well as her podcast that's called Here. H-E-A-R, Here to Slay. And so I invite all of you to check out Roxanne's podcast as well. So again, Roxanne Gay, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you and this conversation, and uh, we hope that we can uh, talk to you again soon. Awesome. Thank you, Architects. And Debbie will be better soon. Just vaccine, you know, it's rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can identify <laughs> with that. Send us a picture of your new house. We'd love to see what it turned oh, out looking like. Will. <laughs> yeah. Great. Great. Bye, Thank thanks. You. Thanks, Roxanne. And to everybody else out there, we're going to stay on here for just a few more minutes and wrap this up. Um, questions, comments on the discussion with Roxanne. Um, thoughts. What do you what'd you think? What did you learn today from this conversation with Roxanne Gay? I forgot to ask her if she was going to go on house to find an architect. Uh, you know, I'm thinking. And I would have answered that question if that's worthwhile, you know, to pay for. Yep, that was probably a missed opportunity. My guess is the answer to that is no. <laughs> but Well, how I are they getting the names, sure. though? Are they just looking up, like, are they asking Barbara Bester for recommendations? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, how does that work? I'm guessing they're talking to people they know. Maybe not. Hmm. Maybe, Asking maybe their friends maybe. like everybody does. Anyway, yeah. yeah, that was um, that was fun. It was. 
Yeah, it's it's fun. So those of you that are uh, joining us, you might have been expecting Debbie Millman. If you missed the very beginning of our conversation, of course, Debbie Millman was uh, planning to be our guest today, um, not feeling well uh, post vaccine, and um, she said, but. Roxanne could fill in for me. So, so we said, yes, let's have Roxanne fill in for you. Mm. Uh, so we really appreciate, um, we really appreciate Roxanne filling in. Yeah. Uh, somebody says nice surprise. It was a very nice surprise, it was. um, that we were able to, uh, uh, to get her on here. And, uh, you know, it's w- one of the things that I love about the live format I was talking to somebody the other day that's just a little bit intimidated by the live format. And, you know, I get it. I'm a little bit used to it by now. But I love the fact that the conversation can just go where the conversation goes. And you don't necessarily know. Right. That's, Mm. you know, there's, there's a little bit of terror of working without a net, but uh, had no idea that Roxanne and Debbie were looking uh, for property and looking to for architects and getting ready to build a house. So yeah. that, ladies and How gentlemen, you know that wow, we should ask all our guests if they're renovating or getting looking for an architect. Hey, are you looking yeah. for an architect? <laughs> <laughs> because they're all bidding on your project right now as we speak. Yeah, that, that was, and also that she was an architecture major in the um, in her early days. I yeah. mean, at, um, I know that as well. Did not know that either. Let's see. What else? What are we saying? Uh, Michelle says she did structural drafting for Barbara Bester's projects back in the day. How about that? Cool. How about that? Yeah. It, yeah. That was um, that was just surprising, especially because I Googled it many times and that never came up. I guess she's trying to keep it a secret. So maybe we should stop talking about it. <laughs> stop talking about it. Oh, it's... She put it out there, so <laughs> I think we're going to be okay with it. Yeah, so Pamela wants to know, when do we send them a qualified list of architects for their house? I don't know. So I think Pam might have said earlier as well that, uh, uh, I don't remember if it was Pam or someone else that said that uh, Debbie probably has some some architect connections. Yeah, she probably um, does. Yeah, I forget who it was that said that. <laughs> yeah, she probably has a few. I don't know. I don't oh, hope they don't give Rod. up on the idea of the swing in the living room because that sounds kind of interesting. That does sound interesting. Yeah. But, you know, I I think all of you, I, I doubt there were any surprises for anybody when when she talked about what they were looking for in terms of, you know, a person they could work with, uh, et, et cetera. But I also think that uh, it's a really good illustration of understanding a client and a an ideal client, you know, what, what they're going to align with. She said, you don't have to be my friend, right? So they're going to value certain things mm-hmm. over other, other aspects, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the idea that they're going to, um, they're doing this because they're both creatives, right? And they, so, you know, the idea of, wanting a place that's tailored to their dual creativity, which I think is, I mean, that's, that's kind of fascinating with, it it feels kind of funny to say they're both creatives. It it seems like that doesn't quite do it justice. You know, they're. It's it's true, but it seems like an understatement. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is an understatement. Um. Erica says that she would have loved for us to get, um, let's see, love for us to get into those topics of, there you go. Thank you for putting that up there. Yeah, that that's part of, you know, I guess we, we could have probably driven to that, but also wanted to uh, kind of let the conversation where she wanted it to go. Um, I wondered about that, you know, do because we did ask her right before before we started you know what do you want to talk about or is there something that you really want to talk about something you're passionate about if she had said that the whole the whole uh whole conversation would have been about that but that's one of the things that we we ask all of our guests is because many of many of our guests 
you know, I mean, Roxanne Gay is a, for instance, there's some expectation, right? Oh, well, she's going to talk about this, or this person has a podcast and they always talk about this or, you know, whatever. Um, so we always ask, what is it, you know, we're pretty sure we know what people expect you to talk about, but what do you want to talk about? Um, that, that's just some of the conversations that we have, uh, have before we bring somebody on, not, not to discount the idea at all, or say that she didn't want to talk about that. I don't want to say that either, but, um, you know, it wasn't something that she said, Hey, I want to talk about this. So kind of got a, it was kind of, well, obviously it was a a last minute, um, Oh yeah. (laughs) So we were, (laughs) you know, we we were just kind of going with it, but also there is part of me that feels like women have other things to say. I mean, I understand that, but I feel like women have other things to say besides always talking about being women in situations. So I said that to Jeff, actually. She did say that to me. I did. Uh, Mark says, love to have her come back to discuss those issues. Yeah. I think if, if we were to have scheduled, you know, Hey, Roxanne is going to be our, our guest. We probably, um, well, we would have been a little more pointed about what the actual topic would have been. And it, it may have, may have completely gone in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. She was able to go with the flow. She really was. She really was able to go with the flow. Yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. So, so just a little more of, you know, sort of behind the scenes um, for us. I mean, this, this went down very quickly, (laughs) you know, Hey, uh, Debbie's not feeling well. She doesn't think she can make it, um, suggested that Roxanne may be able to do it. Um, and then of course, Roxanne said, yeah, I can, I can, I can do it. Um, which, which we appreciate. We really appreciate that because most people would, it would just have been a canceled, right. And then we would, we've been trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, on the backside of it, we've got to shift gears and figure out okay, what do we talk to Roxanne about? Um, you know, what, what questions do we ask? What's the bio, you know, what's the setup, all all those sort of logistical things. Um, and then to have somebody come on the way she did and totally go with the flow that, that might've been one of the easiest conversations we've ever had. I mean, that that's to me. So, you know, as, as the person sitting in this chair and, and, you know, I, w- I want Catherine to chime in on this as well. But for me sitting in this chair, Roxanne Gay was super easy, super kind, um, super accommodating. This was a really easy conversation to just let it go where where it would go and where she wanted to, wanted it to go. So I really, I enjoyed yeah. this a lot. I did too. And I, I mean, I would love to have her back and talk about um, – social issues. And, but I also think it was pretty interesting to imagine her as an ideal client. I, if I, so, I mean, that's a totally different thing and maybe a much lighter topic, but it just, this is a, um, probably a person we'd all would love to create for, mm-hmm. you know, so imagining, just seeing that. I like that. I like that aspect of, of, um, it's a little more personal to what she's doing and thinking about on a personal level, you know? So, yeah, yeah, I, I think that is, you know, when you're, when you talk to a client, when you're working with a client and then, you know, get into what makes them tick, you know, where they're coming from, because it's, it, I look at a Roxanne Gay and, you know, like I said, when this, when this all started changing, Right. And so Catherine and I spent a week preparing for who our guest is going to be. And it, it changes a few hours ahead of time. And yeah. so, oh my gosh, what can we, what can we learn? What can we do to prepare mm. um, in the next hour and a half or whatever it was? And, you know, you just, you can go to RoxanneGay.com, which is actually her website. And you can see this list of all the things that she's written, which is amazing. But I, I think, and, and even, you know, Debbie Millman, oh my gosh, 17 years of, of hosting some of the greatest minds in design on, on, in all kinds of fields. And I, I think for me, it's really easy 
maybe I'm unique in this, maybe not, but it's really easy to go, okay, well, this is what Debbie Millman is like, or this is what Seth Godin is like, or this is what Roxanne Gay is like, or this is like Brian Kramer last week. This is what he's like. But still that, that piece that we see is just this much of them. Yeah. It's like the thing that they talk about every time they go out somewhere. Yeah. Right. So you can hear about it a lot. So I don't know. I feel like getting the tip on the French toast cookie. I mean, (laughs) it's important to us at Context and Clarity. I was very happy to hear that there were no raisins involved. (laughs) There could have been. There could have been. You could still add them. No. No, no. Not me, not you, but someone else. Let's let's be clear. Raisins are okay as long as they're not masquerading as chocolate. That's that's yeah, the that's true. When you mistake the them for chocolate is disappointing for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Disappointing is not the right word. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know what I like to I like to just I have one thing about raisins that I like. And it's taking a raisin and half of a peanut, just the half of the half of the peanut, and then putting them together so they make kind of one full thing and then eating it. And that's a perfect use of a raisin. That's my only use of a raisin. That's what I think. You're like the Dr. Frankenstein of food. I know. I'm very, as I mentioned, I'm very particular about it. Okay. Yeah. All right. But try it. Try that. You'd like it. That's good to know. Okay. Uh, Rod says, uh, I think sometimes people want to talk about things they may not be experts in. You mean things they don't usually talk about? Is that what he means? Uh, I think that's part of it. Uh, yeah. um, so I was talking to somebody that's a, a, a upcoming guest, and they were saying uh, they were talking about. So this is the way it's presented. Basically, um, if you were to think two years from now and you look back, similar to what, what some of you need to be asking your clients, uh, if you imagine yourself two years from now or five years from now, it's probably better off as, as um, uh, an architect for an architecture project. But imagine yourself in a couple of years looking back at context and clarity. What would it take for you to say, I'm really glad that we had that conversation? And so I asked that question of a future guest the other day, and uh, a lot of a lot of what they talked about was the things that they're exploring right now. Uh, you know, and it's it comes down to to passion. So sometimes, sometimes you know, it is um, echo, echo echo Rob. Plus, they want to talk about what's interesting and challenging in their lives right now. Yeah, absolutely. But that's what makes their lives interesting. And, and I'd also love, I love the fact that we just had a, a conversation with Roxanne Gay that has probably never been had on any show or any podcast before. Yeah, there you mm-hmm. go. That's what I mean. I like that about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody at some point will find this interview somewhere and get a unique <laughs> little sliver, a unique little yeah. insight on, on um, who Roxanne Gay really is. Or what she Maybe. wants in the house, anyway. Exactly. Which to me is what, how, what she's really like. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know. Were, were you chuckling at Christian's comment there? Just now? Ch- yeah. I don't know. Oh, oh, I was laughing because the idea of someone finding it. Yeah, it does show a different oh, okay. side of her that maybe, yeah. maybe, I don't know, there's another side of things that maybe people like to curate what information goes out into the world about them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. Yep. All yeah. the time. I mean, not me, but other people. (laughs) I understand. Yeah. (laughs) I understand. Well, with that, um, we have reached our hour. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you, first of all, for hanging in there with us with uh, some of the changes that happened today. Uh, I think it turned out for um, the best, much better than it it might have otherwise. So thank you uh, for... uh, hanging in there. We will reschedule. Uh, we've already talked to her about it. We will reschedule with Debbie Millman for another, uh, another, another, April, date, Fool's day. <laughs> another April Fool's Day. Um, clarity live. Sorry. Thursday. Who's that? Um, so we, we will in the, in the future at some point, we will have Debbie Millman as a guest. So for those of you that were looking forward to that, um, 
uh, we were as well, but we hope that she's feeling better soon and we'll, we'll get her scheduled, uh, in the near future for that. Uh, tomorrow we'll be back to our, our, uh, our mini series, our mini series on digital and social media platforms. We're going to talk about email tomorrow. So, um, your email newsletter, email marketing campaigns, we'll get into that, um, as a uh, revisit on that mini series and then looking forward to next Thursday, uh, the special guest that will be back here, uh, with Catherine and I next Thursday will be Nikita Reed. She is an architect. She is now with Quinn Evans and, um, she f- focuses on preservation, historic preservation a lot. So, uh, we're going to talk with Nikita next week about, um, how do we say it? Connectedness and critical conversations. We're going to talk about breaking down silos. We're going to talk about the communication that's necessary uh, in, in all, all sorts of contexts. So uh, looking forward to that conversation with Nikita next week. We'll give you more information about Nikita. Of course, you can, uh, you can uh, Google Nikita and you can find her uh, Emerging Professionals Awards. And um, she's, she has a relatively new podcast herself. So, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll give you more information on that soon. So looking forward to Nikita, uh, looking forward to the uh, conversation about email for architects tomorrow. Uh, of course the, um, podcast comes out every morning. Context and clarity podcast comes out every morning, 1201 AM Eastern. So I'm sure that you're waiting up with bated breath for that, or maybe getting up early. Um, it's a short form, five to seven minutes long. Every morning, you can drink it. You can listen to it faster than you can drink your coffee, or you can drink it with your coffee. Um, and we're also on the Clubhouse app at 9 a.m. Eastern every morning to sort of our pre-party, preview of the conversation of the day. Um, I like to think of it as our time sort of like sitting around a coffee table, getting the uh, conversation started on the topic of the day. So we'll be on Clubhouse tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Back inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern. So with that, Catherine, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for letting me sit in on the conversation. It's always fun. Uh, You do more than sit in, so I thank you for that. Um, For all of you that are out there, for uh, Roxanne, uh, if you ever listen to this, thank you for joining us uh, for this conversation. It was fun. It was a great one. Uh, Really appreciate you and everyone out there in the audience, whether you're on Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube or uh, the big crowd that's gathering over there on Twitch right now, uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for joining us and all of your comments, all of your questions. Uh, for this conversation here today. So with that, be well, stay well, stay stay safe and stay well, get your vaccine. Um, hope it doesn't have uh, too many negative side effects for you uh, in the meantime. And uh, take a little bit of time to breathe. And and uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe my, my favorite comment today, I don't know, I've still got to think, process it a little bit, but make space for creativity, I think was uh, one of the one of the great things that Roxanne said today. So make space for the things that are important to you. And um, see you tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening and see you tomorrow. Good night.